Let's do it. All right, everybody. We have so much to get through. It's not even funny. Okay. So um, I really went to town on this, on this uh, PowerPoint, so I want to kind of get through this. Okay. Why is this Abyssal of Stissel? Well, because I think the name is catchy, but um, it's Abyssal Stissel because there's so much. I have a, a friend of mine, a colleague, who's teaching a full year course on Stissel. Every class, he's teaching a, um, a, a one class per episode. And there's 12 episodes per season. There's two seasons that already came out. A third one's coming up. So he's on class number 22. Okay, so there's so much to do. So this is just a Bissell. This is just a, you know, a little taste. And uh, maybe if, this, if, you're, if you like this and enjoy this, we can, uh, we can try um, some other things going forward. Now, um, another piece that I'd like to share with you is that I, um, I myself have been part of the Hasidic community. This, is, this show depicts a family um, and people that are connected to the family within a Hasidic community, which is like an ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem. And um, I, I lived in those communities in B'nai Brak in Israel for two years and in Jerusalem. And so I know a lot about it and I had a positive, a positive experience there. And so I, I wanna share that with you as you go along. And I'm just giving you a, like already a heads up that I'm going to be kind of promoting some aspects that I connected to a lot in those, those communities. So this will be kind of like a positive um, presentation of, uh, of the Hasidic community, but I will, I will highlight the, the, some problematic areas as we go along. Um, now, uh, I already talked about the recent, that recent interview, and I, and I um, talked, I feel like I mentioned that before, but I'm also drawing from a few sources here. Uh, my, my, my colleague's Stissel course, he has all of his source sheets up on Safaria under Stissel. So you can find like 20 source sheets there. Um, and in addition, another synagogue, Beth Shalom, Shalom in Potomac, they had a, like a five part course on Shtisel and I took some uh, material from there too. Um, here's the overall course plan. And by the way, um, it says here, we want more Shtisel season three. Well, their prayer was answered. It's coming soon. I don't know exactly when anybody know when. I can't see you actually, but you can uh, just maybe call out. <laughs> We know when it's coming out. No. Okay. No. <laughs> well, this is what I do know. This is our. This is the structure of how we're going to go. Daily life today. Marriage. So there's a lot to talk about in marriage between cousins who get married, uh, annulled uh, engagements, shiduchim, dating, all this stuff. We're going to go through it all and talk about it all. Um, that's June 24th. Uh, June 1st. We're going to July 1st. We're going to talk about major themes. Partially, uh, what I want to focus on a lot is is the idea of obedience versus freedom. Kiva went through that. Um, other characters, his brother also, um, struggled with trying to find himself within this rigid structure of the Hasidic community. And, and what are different approaches to expressing our God-given talents, if they should find their place in our religiosity or not. There's a lot connected to that, so I'm gonna focus on that there. And then abyssal of everything, this is up to us. I have a few ideas on what I wanna put in there, but we can really put whatever we want in the Chaste Hashem cup. It's on the bottom. If you don't know what that is, uh, if, you, if, you, if you've seen the show, you know what Haste Hashem means. If you don't, then you don't. I'm just going to go off this and I want to see if, I can, if anybody uh, offered any chats here. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. All right. Continuing. Um, all right. One moment. All right. So let's get going. Here's what we're doing today. Shtisel isn't so far and after all. I want to show you that there's the, well, the appeal of this show is that it depicts the humanity of the Hasidic community, things that we all go through. And I'll, I'll already show you that. Um, I'll show you that in a moment. But before we get to that, um, I want to talk about how the Torah is a way of life in this community and why that's so central to them and how the whole, the whole, the whole world is centralized around the Torah. Um, I want to talk about beards, smoking, and I'm just doing these... Uh, gestures here and bedside rituals. Okay, so that's the that's what we're gonna be doing today. This is kind of like daily life to some extent. There's a lot of smoking that goes on in the show. Anybody who's, who's watched it knows what I'm talking about. And you have to ask yourself, how is that even permitted? Like, and is this really true? Does that really happen a lot in those communities? I'm not gonna give it away, but you will find that, that out with uh, in the next uh, 25 minutes. All right. So here's, uh, let's get going. And the last one will be bedside rituals, which uh, we'll talk about that when we get there. But basically like the separation of the beds and also prayers that are said on the bed. 
and what people wear to bed. So it's interesting, We're, we'll see that. All right, getting started with the first, um, the first slide, I'm gonna just ask if anybody wants to put um, in the chat section any questions they might have at this point, um, I'm happy to take a look at that. Thursday's one was supposed to start May 2020, but it's set to be delayed because of the virus. Uh, okay, thanks, Linda. All right, we're continuing. Um, okay. Okay, so this show, it, it take, anybody who's seen the show recognizes these different scenes. And I get the feeling that when you look at them, um, they bring, they conjure up different memories and feelings and uh, some funny, some, some happy, some sad, some um, exhilarating. Over here, this scene with the Kinaret, when Akiva um, ends up swimming in the Kinaret, it's like a sign of his freedom and his, um, kind of like a certain feeling of liberation. And this show basically depicts the ins and outs of a, of a Hasidic family. And you get the feeling like you're living in that family. And I don't know about you, but uh, I don't know if anybody, maybe some of you have binge watched. You can write in the chat section if you have. But I actually watched it a long time ago, like around a year ago. And then I had to refresh my, refresh my memory. And so I've watched maybe like, like 15 episodes in the last two or three days. Like I have all like their terminology and all that stuff in my head. So when people are talking, they're like, but then I hold back and I'll say it. But, um, but like all that stuff gets stuck in your head. You feel like you're living with the family. And they go through stuff that we all go through. We go, they go through what the, his brother went through as a search for a personal expression and um, this loving connection and this loving and tenuous connection between Akiva and his father and um, the loving uh, connection between the father, uh, Sholem, and his daughter and the struggles that she goes through. You get to see how this family dynamic, Giti, Giti I believe her name is, and her family um, and loves, and, and there's a lot of love and there's betrayal. There's everything in this show. So you, and a lot of this stuff happens on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I lived in B'nai Brak and, and I lived in this apartment next to this Hasidic family. And I knew when they, when they, when they were, I knew when the woman was giving birth, when the wife was giving birth, I knew when the baby was born. How did I know that? First of all, this, the, our apartments were like separated by this really thin wall. So I could hear her talking to her kids and when she wasn't, uh, I didn't hear her for like a few, like a week or two. I knew she was probably giving birth because I was there for like over two years. And then I would hear like a week or two later, I'd hear crying. I was like, oh, mazel tov. And so they had a lot of kids that family. <laughs> but um, you get a feeling for, uh, you get a feeling for these families. They're just, they go through stuff that uh, all of our families go through. And it's very, um, it gives you a window into that, into this community and, and, and what they experience. And that can be um, extremely, um, um, enlightening and uh, I, I think it's like important for Jews to be able to connect to different Jews and their experiences. Now I'm looking at the at the um, chat chat section. Um, someone's been watching now. Um, yeah, if someone uh, Debbie found the show to be very addictive. I agree. Can't wait for the next season. Me too. Um, okay, the next season everyone's waiting for impatiently. Yeah, m me too. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna continue here. Um, so. So I want to show you just the clip from the, the show. This is a clip which shows a little bit the human side of these families. Now, you oftentimes you see uh, how uh, Hasidic or ultra Orthodox families depicted in the news, they seem like very stiff and standoffish. And oftentimes you can experience that if you go into their communities and they, they feel um, threatened by you per se. But when you're inside, you're inside the community, it's like every other community. Kids are exploring, they're curious, they're having fun, they're playing. Parents are, are, are loving, loving towards each other. And here's just an example of a certain playfulness in that community. And I think the show did really well in the picture. Ani, So a gentleman here is bringing a, a parrot, trying to collect sadaka. That also happens a lot in these communities. <laughs> All the time, people are knocking your door to get sadaka. But um, but he's bringing a, a parrot around, and the kids are, are really fascinated by it, and they start playing. <laughs> Hi, 
story um but again i just want to show you one example there's a few other ones there's other scene where um the kids are in their cheder which is also really nice interesting to see what it's like the dynamic in the school it's their school is called a cheder and um you see the dynamic in the school and at a certain point they want to uh, uh the kids want to see uh the air show there's an air show and the, and you traditionally they stop class and they will watch uh, the planes fly by and in the show they didn't end up doing that for whatever reason but um the kids still in one certain class they were able to see the planes and this idea of being fascinated by the outside world and still being curious and alive and full of full of um energy and curiosity that's that's that happens in that community a lot you just don't see it a lot in the news and, how, and based on how they're portrayed. So I just want to show you, that's kind of, I want to give you a little taste of that. I'm going to go into uh, this next this next section. This is, um, I'm just going to actually stop sharing for a moment. Now I can see you. Um, can you see me? I can see you. For some reason I see Mark Levy's screen as my speaker for some reason. All right. Anyway, um, I can see you again now. Hi. <laughs> um, so right now I'm going to show you a, um, some parts about Torah learning a central, uh, and how Torah learning is very central in that community. And I'm going to offer uh, at least two reasons uh, why and a little bit of my experience with that um, and like what I found powerful about that in that community. All right. Okay, so here is uh, a clip about Torah as a way of life. And this is, <laughs> this is the kolel that uh, Akiva's uh, brother, forgetting his name, um, that he studied in. And this is just what happens on a daily basis. Um, when I lived in Bnei Brak, people just, um, they learned, and this is what men do, like almost all the day. Um, the women oftentimes will work, and they, see, they, they uphold this as a high ideal. Uh, that they have as much Torah in the family as possible. This is just an example. Now, if you pay attention, everyone's smoking here. Um, and so that, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Not to get through, go through all that, but um, but uh, he's obviously holding in his Torah, and they were pretty precise um, in terms of the quotes that they took from the, the Talmud and the discussion. It, it is yeshivish language, um, so that's just an example. But um, that's kind of like uh, people get up they, early, they go they they go to learn, and they come home, they go learn again, and they come home for dinner but with the kids, and they might go learn later on in the day. Um, and the question is, why is this so important? Why do they do this all day long? And why is it important? I mean, if you, if you saw the show, Uchami, um, who's now Esti and unorthodox, she, uh, she was the daughter. She, um, she sought uh, a groom who would learn all day. That was the idea, and that's how they're educated. And the question is, why is that so important? So here's actually a source connected to that. I'm just going to give you the, the, the general idea here. This is from Rav Ben Sion of um, he's a, uh, was a big rabbi. He wrote something here. He talks about how um, this is one approach. There are different approaches. But one idea is that the uh, Torah is like the oxygen of the world, and you need it to breathe and to and to exist. And it has a strong uh, spiritual effect on the world. So the more you study Torah, the more you uplift yourself, the more you uplift the world. And this community has uh, taken upon themselves to to be enmeshed and engrossed in constant Torah, Torah study. And there is precedent for this in our tradition. There was an agreement between uh, Zvulun, uh, Issachar and Zvulun, um, two tribes, one would work and one would study all day. And you have this also with the Levites in the, in the temple where they, the Levite tribe, they were dedicated to the temple all day long. So this isn't foreign to have a group that's, that's completely um, engrossed in Torah and kind of 
forming the heart of the nation spiritually. Now, a lot of people have difficulty with it because when you're in the country, the land of Israel, and you're studying all day and other people are paying for you to study through, through taxes, that can, and you're not sharing in the burdens at times of um, like the army and whatnot, it causes complications. But I'm just trying to present it more in like the, from the positive side of, of everything. So it, the source is pretty cool, but I'm not going to go so deep into that. I want to show you uh, one more skit here um, where Ruhami's um, checking out her, her, her husband-to-be. Um, and he's, uh, this is really intense. And I, I actually saw some of this when I was in Yeshiva in Israel. Oops. This kind of So he's studying, studying, studying. He's getting tired. Uh oh, that can't happen. What does he do? He's checking my chance, chance section. Sorry. Sorry. Alright, here's the last one. She's tired. Mind your cutting. Anyway, so she could be like, this guy's crazy, but she's not, obviously. She's uh, amazed by that, and she wants to be able to support him and to be with him and be part of his Torah study. So that's just like a little bit of the idea that Torah is a way of life. I would say uh, one more piece in connection to the idea, in addition to the idea that Torah um, gives, uh, gives life to the world, um, there's a certain beauty of being, and I'm not saying this is, everyone's able to do this. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm able to do this. Um, but the idea of uh, being around a community, being in a community that's, that their sole focus is Torah and mitzvot, um, there's something very powerful about that, being focused on uh, what, what you believe to be God's will for you um, and being around that all day long and other people are involved in that. It can be really uplifting. And when I lived in that area in B'nai Brak, I felt on a very high level and I also felt like it was very easy for me to, um, like, to do a lot more religiously um, than I was able to beforehand because I was connected to that. So I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Um, people are focused on trying to serve God the best that they can. Um, some people critique it, I said, uh, like I said before, but um, I think there's a lot of beauty to that. Okay, beards. I'm gonna just check my chat section to see if anybody uh, or anything. Um, okay. Uh, so, okay, Yonatan Indersky. Glenna Ross met him in person. Yeah, his story is, fa it is fascinating. All right, so here's the next section we're gonna talk about beards, okay? Now, we have a lot, uh, we have a lot to go through here, but I just wanna go through this in general. Now, beards play a big part in the show. Um, if anybody remembers, um, if anybody remembers uh, what happened with um, Lipe's beard, um, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to give it away, but something happened with his beard, and uh, and it was hard for him at a certain point uh, with that situation in his beard in his community. And so a beard uh, serves many functions in Judaism, and you and they have very long beards. Obviously, these these aren't their beards in real life. Um, Shulam doesn't have that long of a beard in real life. He's actually a comedian. Well, he's clean shaven. Um, so. What, what's where does the beard come from? Why is it important? Why do some go with it? Some go. Your 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 shul rabbis, uh, the majority of them don't have a beard. Meaning, one out of four does. Me, <laughs> um, and sometimes during the Omer, others do. So why do they, Why is it so important that everyone has a beard in this show? So uh, let's talk about that for a moment. So um, the prohibition. There's a prohibition um, in the Torah in Vayikra 1927, that you should not round off the corner of your head. Okay, so that's understood to mean you shouldn't cut this area here. Now, does that mean cut it all together? Well, you're never able to go to a haircut, but many of us, I, I can't see you now, but I'm sure many of us have not had a haircut 
for many months now. Um, so uh, you're, you're doing good, I guess, with this prohibition, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that. It means, according to tradition, it means you can't shave it with a razor. Um, and there's also the prohibition that you can't destroy the edge of your beard. So that comes, comes out to be understood. The, the first part of the verse talks about your pass, basically, your pass area for men, and the beard for men, uh, the edge of your beard. Now, uh, Chazal, the sages say that there are five spots. One, two, three, four. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five. And those areas you can't touch with a razor. So due to the fact that you can't touch those areas with a razor, all these weird laws uh, emerge from there. I wouldn't say weird, but, but when you see these charts, it kind of looks weird. <laughs> but uh, all these laws emerge from there. I'm not going to go over the details here on the left, but um, just take a look at the pictures um, of what you can and you can't shave with a razor. Now, we, the way around it is that if you use electric razor, you're not touching your head directly with a the razor. Therefore, um, you're not uh, transgressing their prohibition. But here are spots. So here's the, here's the part it talks about with you can't encircle your head. And some people are even more strict and they extend it down to here. You'll see briskers that have pay, they'll have uh, sideburns. You think they look like John, they look like John Travolta from, um, what was that movie? Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, when he's saying staying alive, I'm forgetting the name of the movie. But, um, uh, but that's not why they're doing it. They're doing it because the Torah forbade, forbade them to shave over here and they extend it all the way down to here. Um, over here, uh, there's the part of, the, of the, the beard that you can't shave. And so you have, it comes out to one, two, three, and then the other side, four, five. So five spots. And those are discussed in the Shulchan Aruch here. There are five corners of the beard, but there are many opinions. Therefore, one fears heaven will fulfill them all by not using a razor on his whole face. That's where it comes from. So if we knew the spots, you could shave with the razor here, shave here, wherever. Or you could shave here. But we don't know the spots exactly, so we're careful not to put a razor on our whole face. Now, some people are not comfortable saying electric razors are the same as, um, are different than regular razors. So therefore, they're strict, and they'll just grow their beards out altogether. Now, there are different reasons why beards were forbidden. And it's like, why did the Torah say these five locations are problematic? There are many reasons. I'm not going to go into them right now because we're kind of short on time. But um, one reason is that people in biblical times, uh, like priests and stuff, they used to shave those areas. Um, it says here, for instance, some biblical support for Maimonides claim that about Sidelocks. In describing Judah's neighbors, Jeremiah lists the desert dwellers who have the hair of their temples clipped. So other uh, uh, um, Gentiles, as it says, and um, like non-Jews, or, um, or uh, those who are serving idols, they used to cut certain parts of their hair. So we don't want to mimic them. And what, turned, what, what ended up happening is uh, we ended up develop, uh, growing our beards, and then men at least, men, maybe women grow their beards too, but that, that's a whole other story. Um, but growing, growing our beards, and then it became like a Jewish symbol. And after it becomes a Jewish symbol, it becomes very, um, very uh, it, it comes associated, becomes associated with how a Jewish man might look. Now, that doesn't mean that it's forbidden to shave, Obviously, your rabbis are mostly uh, clean shaven. So it's just that you can't shave with a razor and others are more strict and they'll shave it all. Now, why does Rabbi Yoga go with a beard? Um, number one, it, the first main reason is that it's part holiness and part laziness. That's the honest truth. It started with laziness. And then once I got it going, I feel like it's somewhat holy and it helps me spiritually. Um, and there's also a Kabbalistic reason I brought here on the bottom. Um, a couple of reasons that says um, that it corresponds to like this divine beard or this divine trait. And I'll be honest with you, I do feel a certain level of spirituality by having the beard. You could say it's only because I feel like I'm dressed this way and how others perceive me, but I do feel like there's something, the mystics talk about something spiritual about growing a beard. I do feel something, um, feel something to that. But, um, doesn't mean that I have to, like all the mystic, most of the mystics, almost all the mystics have beards. And it's kind of connected to this Kabbalistic reason. So I think the main reason for beards nowadays, though, is that it's a symbol. And you see that. I'm not going to give it away, but you see it in the, in the show with, um, with Lipe and his beard situation. All right. I saw someone at, at wrote something in the chat section. Let me just, uh, let me just see. Um, a Saturday Night Fever. Thank you, Deborah Mitnick. And maybe Mitzi, if she's there, too. Is Mitzi there? Huh. Okay. Um, 
Uh, we have now around five minutes and we have two more topics to get through, but we're going to do it. I'm feeling it. Um, all right, I'm going to get back to uh, sharing my screen with you. And um, please also, I'm, I'm here in the chat section, I'm looking. If you want to add any questions that you might have, um, please offer them there because I, I would like to address them if you have any if you're curious about anything if even if I don't get to it now I can get to it next time also if you have any topics from the show that you found interesting and you had questions about please feel free to add them in that section too in the chat section and then uh, maybe I can address them especially in the last episode where we're, we're kind of we'll we'll, we'll 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 cultivate what that looks like together all right so uh, I'll bring us back to this to the slideshow here um, all right, smoking. They are obsessed with smoking in this show. I mean, it's just all over the place. Um, here is an example. I, like, I think this is a funny example. Okay, so Shulam, someone passed away. Uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the matchmaker passed away and sh they found his uh, notes and Shulam, the father, was looking for a shidduch, for a date. And he wrote in his notes his description of Shulam. It's really funny. <laughs> Are anybody who's seen the show, I think you are laughing at this point. Um, it's funny because he just, that's actually what he does most of the show. He eats, he's always eating and he's always smoking. And that's kind of like how the matchmaker described him in his notes uh, before he passed away. He eats and he smokes. And that's really what happens in the show a lot. You see a lot of smoking. So the question is, is this, how is this okay? We have a prohibition uh, in the Torah. If, if the Torah says, uh, sorry, I didn't bring it here, but here it is. The Torah says, you must take heed unto yourselves. Mishmart that means, this is from Deuteronomy, which uh, the sages understand this to mean you have to take care of your soul. And smoking is dangerous. It harms, it harms the soul. So you should, you, like we're very careful with COVID-19 based on we stay home because we're trying to be extra careful. So why would, we, why, would, why would this community be smoking at all? So for a while, smoking wasn't seen as completely prohibited. Here's an example. Rav Moshe Feinstein, he talked about, um, this is uh, several months after the general surgeon, surgeon general. Moshe Feinstein was one of the big posts, was the, America's biggest halachic authority. And um, he wrote in 1964, and he, and he also wrote in 1981, uh, that it's not completely forbidden to smoke. And here he brings a few reasons. Um, he wrote that um, although it's certainly appropriate to abstain from smoking, one cannot say that smoking is outright forbidden as there are many people that smoke. That's not a proof. Therefore, smokers fit into the character of Shomer Pataim Hashem. Hashem watches over fools. Uh, and also many, many big gedolim, important people smoke. So it's possible to say that it's, it's, possible to say it's forbidden. And he, this, this, this article says, this is probably the primary justification for many a smoker. Now, I'm just gonna explain this idea. I have more here and it's like, it's fascinating. We're not gonna have so much time to go into it now. I think we're gonna save the two beds for next time, um, the bedside rituals, because that's relevant for the next part of the next discussion, which is really marriage. So that's fine. So I'll just go into this a little bit and then we'll close up for today. Um, it's funny, like this is daily living, but all I basically showed you was them, um, like having fun, smoking, um, learning and uh, and growing beards, but I guess that's that is part of that life. Um, also, there's a lot to be said for women's hair coverings, and 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 that is definitely a topic. If you want that to be addressed um, in the final episode, um, you could put that in our final segment. You could put that in the chat section. I'm just going to see um, what chats what people offer there. Um, how can smoke? You can smoke on Yom. This one asks if you can smoke on Yom Tov. How common is it? for first cousins to marry. Okay, so that's gonna be a topic I, I will address. Cousin, first cousins marry, maybe in next, the next episode. Someone wrote, can you smoke on Yom Tov? So if smoking is allowed halakhically, not be, due to the fact that, um, that you're not so concerned how dangerous it is, then you could smoke on Yom Tov in a certain way. Um, but again, most of the, almost all the rabbis nowadays forbid it because it is dangerous to one's health. Rav Moshe Feinstein, in his time, and his, 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 his son, who was a huge rabbi in New York, 
said that if Rav Moshe Feinstein was alive today and he had the data that's available today, he would forbid it too. Um, but in his time, he didn't have that data. And he, 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 and he brought up the claim, the argument, that it's Shomer Ptahim Hashem. I just want to introduce you to this concept, this idea that God protects the fool. So if something is minimal danger, like going out on the street, there's always the danger of getting hit by a car, God forbid. But we go out on the street, and I'm saying it's minimal danger, and it's very difficult for you to abstain from it. So then we say, God takes care of the fools. God takes care of those who are innocent. They don't know. We kind of apply that. It's a general principle. So in his time, he thought that it wasn't so dangerous uh, for those to smoke. And a lot of rabbis thought that. There are even sources that say smoking could be beneficial. And it clears, it, like, it helps with the, the intestines. It like, helps you with your bowel movements. Um, and so, uh, so the, the science was off. But the, the rabbis have upgraded the halacha in our days. But I will say on the ground and uh, that the Hasidic community, there's a lot of smoking that goes on there. There's a lot. I mean, I was in that community. Uh, there's smoking going on all over the place. And a lot of times in the study centers, like we saw in the show, um, I think it's part, partly due to addiction. And, and that community is just kind of used to be do, used to doing it. I'm not sure how vocal like the Hasidic rabbis are on this. I was once at a Hasidic rabbi's house on Yom Tov, like someone mentioned in the chat section, if you're allowed to smoke on Yom Tov. But I was in a, I was in a, um, sorry, I was checking the chat section here. Um, sorry, I'm not, somehow my screen sharing is paused. Uh, let me come back here. Um, I'm back with you now. Um, I, was, I was at a Hasidic Rebbe's house on Yom Tov, and I was so surprised. I was like newly religious, and all of a sudden I saw him uh, light up a, a cigarette. Uh, on, on, I think it was like maybe Rosh Hashanah or something. I was like, what? Um, so it happens. It happens a lot. I think that it's kind of like an insular community, a Hasidic community, even more than our Moshe Feinstein's community. And perhaps they, uh, they, they're not heeding scientific guide, gu guidance as much. Um, or perhaps people are just addicted and it's hard to tell them to stop. But, but it, 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 all, all, all the posts in today say it's forbidden. Um, someone, so I'm just going to read a few chats and then I'm going to sign off here. Uh, someone wrote, my grandparents are first cousins. Okay, so I'm just going to, um, there is a case of first cousins getting married in Shtisel. We're going to talk about that and if that, uh, how that happens halakhically. And if, if we're afraid that the children are going to come out looking like aliens or something, obviously they weren't. Um, now, uh, my husband's grants are first cousins. Cyril is his own third cousin. I have no clue what that means. Cyril is his own third cousin. That's deep. Okay. Um, I don't know what that means. Okay. So we got through a few things today. We got a little uh, taste of shtisel. Um, there's a lot more uh, to go through. Uh, I suggest, if you can, to watch a few episodes if you haven't this week. And if you have, if you've already seen, uh, seen it before, maybe do a little refresher. Watch a few episodes, maybe your few or favorite episodes. It's on Netflix. You have to have a membership to Netflix, but a lot of us have family members who have, who have memberships. And then you just need a kind and patient child to help you get set up. Um, that happened with me uh, and, my, and my, 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 my father and stepmother are here. Um, and they're on now and they're watching it. So um, everything's possible. And although that took kind of like a long time, but it worked out. Anyway, I just want to bid everyone uh, farewell for today. I want to thank you for joining. And um, I think we have a lot of exciting stuff ahead of us. So um, let's, uh, let's keep up the momentum. And we have good stuff ahead of us. Have a good day.